This is Deacon Bill doing Deacon Bill's diary. As we talked about, we're going to do a couple of these on God and money. So this will be God and money from the second one. So if you remember from the first one, one of the key concepts we talked about was God and money. No man can serve both God and mammon. And if you remember, mammon was that obsessive focus on wealth with a debasing influence on life. You know, in the church, I think a lot of us, we like to keep our money and our faith separate. And the reality is we have one soul. We've got to bring the two together. So how do we think about money and wealth as Christians? That's really what I want to talk about today. I want to do the parable of the rich young man. This is found in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. I'm going to skip a few of the verses, but I want to read it to you directly. This is actually from USCCB. So the young man approached him and said, Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus answered him, Why do you ask me? And so Jesus was said, What do you need to do? You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall live with your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. The rich young man said, Well, I've done all of these. But Jesus still says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. The rich young man was just dejected because he had so many possessions, and he walked away. <clears throat> so a little bit later, Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, to his disciples, it will be hard for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I say it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for rich ones to enter the kingdom of heaven. And what he's talking about here is, in the Middle East, you've got, the cities had walls around them. We think of the eye of a needle like a little sewing needle. But really, you know, the camel is these wild animals. What the eye of a needle is, it's a wall, it's an opening in the wall, and it kept invaders out, and also protected the city. So to get into the city, you'd have to dismount your horse or your camel, walk through, and it was a better point of defense. So you can't bring your wealth into the city. You have to take it all and enter humbly into the city. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And in this case, he knew the man needed that for his soul. But in the, some of the early um, days of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea was a very wealthy man. He let Jesus use the upper room, very fruit, fruitful for Christianity. And Jesus let him keep his wealth because he was using it for the kingdom. And if you think about the disciples, they all gave up their careers. We know some of them were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. And they all had careers that they just walked away from to follow Jesus. But I mean, what did they give up to spend that time really being with Jesus? Did they really lose anything? So how do we think about how much money should we give the church? What we talk about in Catholic teaching is to tithe. 5% to your local parish, and 5% to charitable causes. That gets you to 10%. And that's sort of the, the target you want to talk about. We talk about alms giving and additional gifts. But that's the way to think about it. And if you can't do 10%, think about how much you can give to the church and where you're spending your money. We have to remember that all our possessions come from God. And he gives them to us to use. So God wants us to be prosperous, but he also wants us to be generous. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of scripture in the Psalms and the scriptures talking about giving with an open hand. Just give. And the Jews had a concept in their fields. They'd leave the edge of the field on the top, and then the poor people would come and take that and use that wheat to make their bread. So that was their way of, of giving to the poor. And even in the early church, we start to see some of the roots of capitalism. You had the monasteries, and these are the monks living there. So what they would do, they have the people growing the wheat, they bring it to the monastery, the monastery would break the bread, bake the bread, and sell it to the people and keep them from starving. So the people, the farmers would prosper, the people had food to eat, the monks could afford to keep their monasteries going and their prayer, and that became very successful. In fact, down the road that led to some of the challenges, the monasteries became very wealthy and they started to see corruption. So capitalism and the monastery system is good. It's the excess of wealth and the greed and the mammon. That's where we get in trouble with money. 
So I do want to piece a little bit from the catechism. I actually have a copy here. I, I tend to use this a lot. It's a great reference book for me. It's sort of a practical how-to guide. We have one of the big concepts, uh, the right to private property. This is uh, paragraph 2404. The ownership of any property makes its holder a steward of profits with the task of making it fruitful and communicating its benefits to others. First of all, his family. So the church doesn't deny you happiness for your family, but you want to use that to grow the kingdom and to help your family grow and to help that next generation be better off than you are. One of the big concepts in Catholic social teaching, which I think we're kind of missing in our modern society, is this concept of the common good. The sum of the total conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. That's from the Catechism Life in Christ, section 1905. So we want to focus on the good, and sometimes that means we have to give up something and to help the poor, but we want to focus on how we make the best good, and not just necessarily a straight handout or keeping all the wealth for ourselves. We've got to be generous, we want to be loving, and make sure there's nobody starving or homeless to the extent we can. In economics, just some, I'm going to quote a few quick ones from Catholic Social Justice. Um, this is section 2426. Economic life is to serve the human community. That's from 2430. And again, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. Work is a dignity, it's a gift. We want to earn work. We want to earn the fruits of our labor, and we want to be paid fairly. So I'm going to read one section directly from the Catechism. This is section 2432, and this is really aimed for businesses. <clears throat> Those responsible for businesses, enterprises, are responsible to society for the economic and ecological effects of their business. They have an obligation to consider the good of persons, and not only the increase of profits. Profits are necessary, however. They make it possible for investment that sure the future of a business and they guarantee employment. So it's, it's good to have a business, it's good to have profits, but you need to make sure you take responsibility for what that business does and be fair to your workers and the community. So our next video, I'm gonna focus a little more practically on how we use money and debt in some more practical terms versus some theological terms. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, go in peace.